Okay, everybody, we're in Masechet Aruvin, Daf Yod Tet. And uh, we have uh, sev several interesting subjects. Uh, first of all, we're going to be talking about a couple of uh, last Agadot. The previous Daf was a whole series of Agadot from Rabbi Yirmiya Ben El Azar. And so now we're going to have uh, just another about his statement uh, regarding um, punishment and the under underworld. Um, uh, it's a very important and interesting discussion about Gehinam and, and, and related concepts, and also about an Aiden. Um, and then we're going to finish, that's the end of the Agadah, and we'll get back into Halakha regarding our Mishnah of the corner boards. Um, a couple of details as to how we measure them with the animals tied together, and then the dimensions of an ox itself and how much room we need. Um, and Papa is going to discuss that. And uh, then finally, we'll end with uh, a question, several questions. Asks Lava. Um, um, he's uh, we, a series, whole series of questions. Today we'll see four of them. So let's jump right into it. They say, Hakadosh Baruch Hu is not his ways are not the ways of. A, 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 a human king. A human king, if he wants to punish, needs to punish someone with the sentence of death, um, he, they put a, a, a hook in his mouth so that he cannot speak and curse the king, right? I mean, everyone would be afraid to say something negative about the king, but someone who's already on death row is not so afraid because uh, what, what else are they going to do to him? And so the kings uh, back then, they would make sure he couldn't speak at all. They would gag him. However, HaKadosh Baruch is not, is not so. Um, uh, the Pasuk says that uh, for, for God, for Hashem, silence is considered praise. And that even apply, applying it even to someone who is deserving of, uh, of capital punishment. Um, uh, not only does the, is a person, he, let's say, you know, um, we're talking about a case when, let's say, someone is, uh, is martyred or, you know, and enemies come and he has to give his life. Um, so the person, not only does he not complain, but he even, even considers it a praise. Um, and it's considered also as if he gave sacrifice. He's been sacrificing his own uh, life. And so and, uh, when Jewish people are, are forced to, to give their lives, uh, you know, uh, as, as even, even if it's as a punishment, they accept the, the verdict and uh, they, they consider it a sacrifice for atonement and that God's judgment is correct, right? And unlike a human king, where they think it's unjust and they curse the, the king. Okay. Very interesting. So now, along this theme, we say every day in the beginning of Mincha, which literally means those who pass through the valleys of weeping, in turn, those tears of weeping, they're in sorrow now, will one day turn into blessing. And they'll be like a water, a, a spring of water. And be even more, more water, which is rain, the early rain that comes with blessing. So um, their sorrow will be turned into blessing. That's the pshat. But the Midrash says, elu adam shel hakadosh baruch hu. Overe means those who transgress laws. They are these people who deserve to go down to the lowest depths. Of Gehinam, Abacha Shebochin Moridin Demaot Kemayan Shel Shitin, and they cry. Um, their tears flow like the foundation spring. In other words, a spring that's very deep. Gam Berachot Yate More Shemastikin Alehen Et Hadin Vamirim Lefanav Ribono Sholam Yafe Danta Yafe Zakita Yafe Chiyavta Yafe Tikanta LeGehinam Larshaim Gan Aeden. La Sadikim. And so Berachot means first to the blessings that the person, even though they are suffering, they attribute blessing to the more, a teacher or a disciplinarian, meaning God, and they say, um, Hashem, you judged well, and you uh, you um, uh, you uh, decided 
that this person is meritorious and this person is liable, and you appropriately establish Gehinam as a punishment for Resha'im and Gan Eden for Sadiqim. Right? That's called Siduk Hadin, uh, which is a major part of our Tefillah. Whenever someone dies, we say Siduk Hadin. Right? Whatever happens, God is a true judge. Okay, so again, here, the idea that although the uh, people, even people who uh, receive punishment, uh, accept it and bless God. In other words, they're making teshuva and accept the punishment uh, just as they die. Okay, now now we question this. Ini, hold on, is that true? We have a contradictory statement. Shimon ben Lakish, that's Resh Lakish. Resha'im afilu al shel geinam enam chozrin b'tshuva shenemar v'yatsu v'ra'u b'pigre ha'nashim ha'posheim bi she'pashu lo ne'emar ela ha'posheim she'posheim v'holechim le'olam. He says that evil people, um, even at the at entrance to gain them, and they see that they're going to be punished, even then they refuse to repent. They are so stubborn. And his, his uh, proof is a verse from Yeshaya, which says, those people who are sinning in the, in the present tense. In other words, and he's looking at, Yeshaya's looking out at a, at a, 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 a place where there's all carcasses who are, who are being, um, you know, who are being consumed and, and uh, you know, uh, the fire. So this is, you know, he's like describing a scene like Gehinam, and he says they are sinning. In other words, they continue in their state of sinning and don't repent even in Gehinam. How come you just told me before that even evil people do repent before Gehinam? And here it says they do not repent. Um, so that's the contradiction. The first statement, those who repent, that's talking about those among the sinners among the Jewish people. They understand and they repent before they go to before they go to Gainam and are saved from it. Um, however, the evil the, the sinners from other nations, they do not repent. And so this Pasuk about Posha'im is referring to other nations. Okay, and first we bring a proof, then we're going to reject this. And here's a proof to Imken. Reshakish is the one that said this statement about, uh, uh, about um, the Posh'aim. And so too, he said another statement here that the uh, uh, sinners of Israel, the fire of Gainam does not apply, does not, come, has no, does not apply to them. And we learn this from the Mizbeach, uh, the, the golden altar where we have uh, the incense and the Mishkan. Just as this golden uh, altar um, had only just a thin layer of, of, of gold, which was not a, very, um, not a very sturdy metal, and yet the fire on it did not damage it. So too, so too, the sinners of Israel, even the sinners of Israel, although they do they, they did uh, many bad things, but they all are also full of good um, good deeds, like a rimon. It reminds us of Rosh Hashanah eating the rimon, right? As it says, literally means your temples, describing uh, the uh, beloved, are like a split pomegranate. Um, uh, so Resh Lakish, Amar Be'er Shemun Ben Lakish, same sage, says on that, Al Tikre Rakatech, don't read your, your forehead, but rather, Rekatech, Shafilu Rekanin Shebecha Mele'in Misvot Karimon, Alachat Kama Vechama. So even your empty ones, in other words, Jewish people, even though they are sinners, and even the most empty of them, they, even they are full of mitzvot, like Rimon, right? They're bound to do some good deeds here and there, even inadvertently, you know, they take a nap on Shabbat. Okay, good, right? They did something good. They help out someone, help out their grandmother. Whatever it is, right, they, uh, there are still opportunities to do mitzvot. And so therefore, despite the negative things they did, they make teshuva and they don't deserve to go uh, to, to, to be punished in Gehinam, right? And if that's true for the altar, all the more so for them. And so this is a proof that for Resh Lakish, that he, of uh, that resolution, that Jewish sinners, um, repent and do not get punished, as opposed to non-Jewish sinners. Okay, so that was a proof, but now was a rejection. Okay, so 
Aulaton Velo Me Bashkar Le. What about the other Pasuk that says that they pass through the valley of weeping? And that's another, that's a term, a synonym for Gehinam. And that's talking about Jews, right? Because it says that they, they repent um, and they accept it. But they did go, they do go to Gehinam. So we resolve this one also. And says it just means that they go for a second to gain them, but Abraham Avinu is always watching and realizes that the people that are part of the Berit uh, don't belong there. So he swoops in and he saves uh, his descendants. Um, so this is true for anyone from Israel except for someone who has relations with a Gentile because um, uh, it's as if his foreskin is drawn by people who had circumcision and wanted to hide it, they would um, draw the skin out. To hide their identity, and so someone who has relations with the Gentile, basically, he's giving up his his uh, identity as a Jew, and so therefore, since he's not Jewish anymore, he doesn't get that special treatment from Abraham Avinu. I think this is quite uh, interesting because you know, technically, halachically, relations with a Jew is not considered incest. It's not among the laws uh, um, of incest. So, um, so you know, what's so bad about it? And I think this is the answer. Um, although it's not under the category of adayot. I think it's not because it's a close relation or anything or adultery or anything like that, but it's a different, uh, different problem altogether, which is just um, uh, um, uh, 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 denying one's uh, fundamental Jewish identity. And uh, that's, I think that's what this Gemara is, is getting at. Okay, so we resolved that problem, but now we have another question um, on, this, on this theory of splitting uh, the Jewish people and other nations. Uh, you just said poshleim is in present tense, and it means that they are still currently sinning even while they are being punished. Hold on, is that true all the time? Does, does the, that, the, that form of a verb always mean present tense? It doesn't because these are two different pesukim. And as God says, hamotzi etchem. Right, God took, a, took, takes, took us out of Mitzrayim. Well, took in the past, even though it says hamotzi, and that sounds like a present tense verb. So a verb in that form, you see, can sometimes refer to the past. And similarly, hamale, which is found in uh, Vayikra. So demasek udemapeku, ela deasek veapek. Is he currently, is God currently taking us out of Egypt? No, he did it in the past. Achinami de Here too, in the Pasuk in Yeshaya, although it says posherim, I can refer to uh, that the fact that they sinned in the past. And so now, now that with this interpretation, there's no contradiction whatsoever. Um, and so all this, may, this, this means that all sinners, uh, before they get to Gainam, they already, uh, they already repent. And so we don't have to use that answer of, uh, between the Jews and others. Um, although it wouldn't make sense if everybody repents, then uh, there would be nobody in Gainam. So I guess someone has to be there. Uh, at least it opens the possibility that some people from all nations uh, can repent and then uh, would not deserve that punishment. Mm. Okay. Um, so um, uh, now a little, uh, a little bit more. Okay, another statement by uh, the same sage. Amar Rabbi Yirmiya Bar El Azar. There are three uh, entrances to Gainam in the world. Um, I mean, sometimes we think of Gainam as kind of a, a, a spiritual place for, for souls, but here you see it's saying that it's a, the entrance is somewhere, somewhere on earth, and this um, uh, probably accurately, accurately reflects the, um, the notion of what Gainam meant in the ancient world, basically the underworld, right? So if we bury people in the ground, and so like what happens to them, there's a kind of shadowy, Existence somewhere down under, and so these are these uh, three entrances. Um, there's one in the wilderness, and one in the sea, and one in Yerushalayim. We bring proofs for each. This is regarding Korah, right? They go down. The, the earth splits, and they go down um, to uh, Sheol. Sheol is the name uh, is the name for this uh, for the underworld, and so there you go. So that and that happened in the wilderness in the desert. So this is from Yonah, where when he's in the, in the belly, he's in the middle of the, of the ocean, he says, from Sheol, I cried out. And so there must be an entrance to Sheol in the, in the sea as well. Yerushalayim, 
So this pasuk that uh, is referring to Sion and Yushalayim and the furnace um, is interpreted to mean that is an en- that is the entrance to Gainam. So there you go. We have three entrances. Now we wonder about this. That's it. That's the only entrances. Oh, that should be enough. No, uh, we don't want more entrances there. Okay, so there are two date trees in the valley of Ben of Ben of, of, of Ben Hinom. Um, this is an actual place that's mentioned in Tanakh, and you can go there. I've been there. Um, so yes, I've been to Gehinom. Right? Um, it's a it's a valley right on the south uh, south of the old city of Jerusalem, and uh, you know that's uh, it's a place where um, that was the locus of Abu Dazara back in the time of the first Beit Hamikdash. Um, I remember when I went there was uh, we went on the tiul with our yeshiva, and we were walking around there on Shabbat with dress shoes, and uh, while we were there, there was some some. Uh, some guy like uh, was uh, was bothering us and started uh, throwing things at us from from above, from an Arab, and it was kind of scary. We had a, a sniper with us, and he like set up his 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 gun, and uh, we all had to like run out of there, um, it, which was not so easy with dress dress shoes running up that uh, running up the hill of that valley. Um, so anyway, Gehinam is a scary place. I can attest to that. Uh, that was one of the scarier moments of my year in Israel. Uh, don't tell my parents about that. Um, okay, so anyway, there, this is a place, and so this says there are two uh, trees there, and there's smoke coming out of them, so obviously that must be the smoke coming from under, un, the underworld. Okay, that, we regarding, uh, regarding Lulavim happens to mention them, that they are kasher for Lulav, even though their branches are, uh, are kind of thin, but it's uh, still allowed, you can use it for Lulav. Um, uh, but incidentally, we learned that this is one of the entrances. Okay, well, so, so that's a question. You said there's only three entrances, but here, there's a fourth. We answer, maybe that's the one that's in Jerusalem, right? With the Jerusalem one, we didn't say exactly where it is, so this is it. So that's no problem. This is included among the three. Okay, more on the topic of Gainam. That's a fun topic. Amar be Yoshua ben Levi. Okay, all places, almost all places that are mentioned in Tanakh, uh, words that are mentioned in Tanakh. And so let's uh, show each one. She'ol, She'ol's a very common one. We read that already. Abadon dekhtiv haisupar bekever Right, can I, can I sing your praise when I am in Avadon? So in other words, you know, uh, after a person is dead, can you sing praises? Ber uh, Shahat, right, the, uh, a, a, a well of destruction. Dikhtib, ki lo tazob nafshi l'shol, lo titen hastecha sidecha l'rot shahat. So you see that she'ol is parallel here to shahat. Okay. Uh, God, you took me out of right this this place of uh, of uh, the destruction. Salmavit, uh, shadow of death. Well, that's pretty clear. Um, However, the words uh, um, underworld, right, the land down under, um, that is not from a pasuk, but that's known by tradition that that's another name that people call the underworld. Okay, so there you go, that's the seven names. And now we ask, Fetuleka, hold on, that's it. Baika Gainam, you didn't, you didn't count Gainam as one of the list. Oh, no, Gainam is not actually a proper name that the Talmud explains, but rather Ge, a valley, Shamuka, Shakol Yored La Aliske Hinam. It's a deep valley that all those who are involved in vain things, Hinam, uh, go down uh, to that place. So it's just a valley of uh, for for vain things. But it's not a it's not a proper name. Okay, I mean in, in Peshat of the Torah, it's the name of an actual area because it was all full of avodah zarah and evil things. So that's why it got this you know uh, bad. It, it became associated with 
the punishment that those people would uh, would get. Um, okay. Um, here's another one, Pasuk in Yeshaya, that says, Ki aruch met mol tofteh. This is places ordained of old, and it describes a place of fire and terrible. Ahu, so isn't that another name for Gainam? Ahu, shakol mitpane, shakol mitpane, bitzro, yipol sham. No, it's not, a, uh, it's not a place name, but rather a description. Tofteh, uh, like hamipate, uh, anyone who's seduced by his evil inclination will go there. So it's a description of the people, not a, a name of a place. Um, okay, good. So that concludes our discussion of Gehinam, and from Gehinam we go to Gan Aiden, uh, thankfully. So Gan Aiden, Amaris, like Yishim Beres Yisrael, who? Where is it? Well, I, we don't know exactly where it is, but if it's in Israel, then Bet She'an Pitcho, then the entrance must be Bet She'an, because Bet She'an is such a beautiful place, has nice trees and produce, so that, uh, you know, draws from the nourishment of Gan Aiden. If it's in Arabia, then this must be this place, Beth uh, Garden. If it's in Mesopotamia, it must be in uh, Damascus. It sounds like Damascus. All right, so these are all wonderful, fertile places. Um, um, and so, um, uh, if it's in, if it's in, uh, 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 yeah, right. And so Abaye uh, said that uh, the said the fruits on the right bank of the river Euphrates are great, and Ava would praise the fruits fruits of this place. Arpanya. And so, uh, what I think they're all assuming is that uh, Gan Eden uh, can be a place somewhere on Earth that's uh, as lush and beautiful grounds. I remember there was all uh, 60 minutes once about a place in Iraq that uh, Saddam Hussein uh, drained the, the water co from coming from, but once upon a time it was, uh, people considered, considered it uh, like Gan Eden because it was so lush and beautiful. So I would say uh, if Gan Eden is in Brooklyn, then it's in Uri's fruit market. All right, that's my own addition. Um, okay, and that ends our discussion of Gan Eden, and it, it ends the Agadot. And so now we uh, are going to transition into the halachot. Um, and so first, uh, two, uh, two uh, halachot about the measurements and dimensions of, uh, of these corner brackets, right? So once again, if you have a well in the middle of the Shut HaRabim and you want to be able to uh, draw water from it and carry it around, you know, just enough so that you can drink it and your animals can drink from it, so you don't need to build a full wall. Um, but the rabbis were lenient for, to have access to water and said you only need to make four corner brackets, one amma by one amma, right, um, all, all around. So let's see some more details about that. So um, the, uh, oh, uh, okay, the Mishnah said, Ubenehen kim lo shene, right? So the Mishnah said that between each of, the, each of them, uh, yeah, here, between each, uh, let me show you. But here, okay. Um, okay, between the post, you can have a large space. Um, and how big is that space? Enough of uh, two sets of three oxen that are tied together. The Mishnah continues and says they have to be tied together. According to me, three, according to me, four, um, but they have to be tied together and not loose. So this is strange language. Why do you have to say tied together and not loose? Isn't that the same? Right? Obviously, if they're tied together, then they're not loose. Why does Mishnah use double language? Oh, okay, simple answer. I might have thought when you say tied, not actually tied, but as if tied, like almost that much. And then it says no. And not loose, meaning really literally tied. That's how you have to take the measurement um, for, the, uh, for the maximum space between. Okay, good. Um, all right, so now, uh, once again, the space between them, right, according to the Bi uh, is uh, three and three, which comes out to a total of 10. According to the Biuda, it's four and four, which comes out to a total of 13 and uh, third. We're gonna see right now how we come to that calculation. You have to allow for two sets, one coming in and one going out. 
um, you know, side by side. Tenoda banan. Um, how much is the length and the width of an ox, and how much does, how room does it need? Um, uh, 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 sh- sorry, how much is the head and most of it? Right? Mishnah said that the smallest you can make the corner brackets is enough that there is enough space between the edge of the well and the edge of the of the uh, and the and the and and the edge of the bracket um, enough for uh, the head and the majority of the animal to be uh, to be in it. So how how much is that for an average ox? Two amot. Okay. So you're going to need two amot from the edge of the well to the edge of the wall. Okay. So remember that that's two amot. It's going to be important. And how about the width of the of each ox? How much room does it take? One and two thirds. Okay, good. So if you have one and two thirds, um, according to the Bimei who says you need three and three. So one and two thirds, that's times six, you get 10. And according to the Biuda who says it's four and four oxen, right, side by side, he's assuming sometimes when you have a uh, hard land, we need stronger, more, more ox power. So if it's four by four, that's eight ox lengths altogether. Um, so that's eight times one and two thirds, and that gives us uh, 13 and a third. And so the Buddha says, expresses that as ki shalosh estama uch arba uch arba estama, about 13 or 14 a month. It doesn't say exactly 13 and a third, it says about 13 or 14. Now, this is kind of a confusing way to say it. So what do you mean, ke said about 10? Ke said ha'esed avyan, it's exactly 10. You said one and two thirds times six, right? There you go, you got 10. Why are you saying about 10? Answer, mishum de ba'ad amit na'asefa kish lo shesreh. Okay, the bimei said about, only because the biudah said about. And we want to make a parallelism in the baraita. And so his ke said is actually, in fact, exactly 10. Uh, so he only said that because of the biudah. All right, so let's ask the biudah. Kish lo shesreh tefeavyan. What do you mean about three? It's, it's, it's about 13. It's more than 13. Mishum de ba'ad amit na'asefa Oh, he wrote, he said, he said about 13 because he wanted to say about 14. Hold on, but it's not 14. It's not even, it's not even close to 14. It's only 13 and a third. I'm going to papa, you not What it meant to say by this language is it's more than 13, but, not, but less than 14. So between 13 and 14. Okay, that's a complicated way. I think he just should, he could have just said 13 and a third. Um, but um, maybe they, they're, uh, you know, when, when they measured things back then, they weren't taking tape measures exactly. They were saying, oh, 13 or 14, right? Sometimes I act a little bigger or a little smaller. So he expressed, expressed it in that way. But in fact, if you calculate it, it'll be 13 and a third. Okay, good. So um, now, we, uh, now we understand all those calculations, and that's very helpful. Raf Papa is going to give an interesting application of, of, this, of the pr- principles we just had. Okay, let's explain this case. Uh, this is actually a better, uh, this is the best picture here, actually. It's a simple picture, but it'll explain it better. Let's say you have uh, a well. We assumed usually that the well is kind of small, but not necessarily, right? The, uh, the well or cistern, can be, um, can, be, uh, can be bigger. So if the well itself is eight amot in diameter, okay? And we also said another principle that you need two amot of space from the perimeter of the well to the edge of the, of the diom, diom din, right? So you're gonna have to have at least two on this side and two on this side so that the majority of the ox's head and uh, body can fit, can, can fit in here and, and still drink from water. So if they think this is eight, then the entire span is gonna be eight plus two plus two is 12. So um, if, when you put that over here, well, this is one, right? And this corner bracket is one. And so that means the space in between is 12 minus two is 10 altogether, right? So if the, if the, if the cistern is eight um, uh, in diameter, then the space from here to there is going to be 10. 
10 is good. According to all opinions, you're allowed to have a space of 10. And so that's just fine. So everyone agrees that this is okay and you don't have to add any more uh, posts. However, if it's 12 big, right? So now 12 uh, requires two more on each side. So that's going to be 14 here and then 16. If, it, if this whole length is 16, so take away one for, for this corner bracket and one for those corner bracket, and you get a space of 14 in the middle. 14 is more than 10 and is more than 13 and a third. So this kind of setup, according to all opinions, will require that you add another post, another post. So that we never have a span that's more than 10 or 13 and a third. Okay, so these are the two extreme cases where everybody will agree that you don't need to add a post here and you do need to add a post here. However, the machloket between the BMA and the BMA will apply to anything in between. If it's nine or 10 or 11, then um, you'll have a space that's more than 10, uh, but uh, le uh, more, more than 10, but less than 13 and a third. And so that's what he says in the next uh, line. Says the max is 10, and therefore you will require to add um, posts, mid, mid posts. says it's uh, still less than 13 and a third, so you don't need to add mid posts. Okay, that's Rav Papa's statement, right? And so an interesting application of these dimensions. Now, Rav Papa, my kamash malan. Okay, that just took us a few minutes to explain because it was a little bit complex, but for the Talmud, it's like, well, that's obvious. What is he teaching us, right? He's just, I mean, taking basic principles that we just said and applying it in a new case, but he's not actually teaching us any new law, right, that we couldn't figure out ourselves. Um, tenena, we already had a Braita that told us, right, the minimums and maximums and how big, how much uh, room an ox takes up, that you need two amot on the, on the sides for the majority of the ox to go and drink. Right? I mean, if that's the only new thing we learned from there, then we know that already. So we answered, Papa Baraita la The Papa did not know that first Baraita um, that told us that it's uh, an axis two by one and two thirds. And so that's, he's, he's giving all this scenario precisely to teach us that. And so now he's teaching us that, that law um, in the Baraita. Right? So don't be surprised, not every Amora knew every Baraita. I mean, we assume they knew all the Mishnayot and all the you know major things, but but I thought were not collected ever, um, and so you know different sages remembered different collections of but I thought, and so that Papa is teaching it, it to us uh, independently of the Baita, but it's good that we have a uh, double confirmation. Okay, so that ends section uh, section two of the Daf, and now we're going to the last section, which is um, four questions for today. There'll be more questions tomorrow. That Abaye. Uh, fourth generation Amora asks his teacher Rabba, the third generation Amora. First, he's going to talk a bit, uh, asking about lessening large gaps according to the Bimeir, then the same question according to the Biuda. Then he's going to ask, can you use a mound of earth as one of these corner boards? And then he's going to ask, can you use reeds as a corner board? So let's see. Um, we have a mnemonic uh, for the next, for the series of questions that's coming up. Um, but let's get to the first one. Be'amine Abaye Merabba He'erich Bediyum Madin Keshi'or Peshutin Terebi Meir Mahu Okay, so here's the question. Instead of adding a mid-post, let's say it's too big. Instead of adding a mid-post, am I allowed to make the side post, the corner post, longer? In other words, if I'd say I have a space here of uh, 14, right, between them. And uh, so I know I could add a mid-post, but I, I don't want to do that. I want to take this one, instead of making it one ama, I'll make it two or three. And I'll make this one extend it two or three until this one is smaller than 10, right? Is that okay, right? Or is it just that from the corner to the corner, it's too big altogether, I just need something in the middle. Somehow putting something in the middle gives a visual effect of it being more enclosed, right? Or is it just simply about the space and the extent, extending it would be sufficient? That is the question, um, and so we're asking it uh, first according to the Bimeir. Um, mahu. Amale. So Rabbi answered, Tinituha. We already learned it in the Mishnah. We can infer it. I love the Mishnah said, you can make uh, this bracket thing um, as big as you want. 
as long as you add to the boards, right? So if it says adding to the boards, it means you're adding, taking the board and making it longer, right? Doesn't it mean that? And therefore, yes, you can do that. We say no, not necessarily. La demapish beavid pishutin. Maybe it means add boards, not add to the boards, but add more boards. Hold on. Yachi hay bilvad sheir be pifasin ad sheir be fasin mi baide. Rather than said add to the boards, it should have said add boards, which would mean add more boards. We answer that tene ad sheir be fasin. You're right. That's how we should read it. Right? Read the Mishnah as if it says ad sheir be fasin and take off the bet. Either it means that you should amend it and actually take off the bet. Maybe there's a tradition that that's how it's read, or it means that you can understand it that way, no matter whether it or not there's a bet there. Okay, so um, uh, so it's, that's inconclusive. We have another a version of that answer, um, and uh, uh, which has comes to the opposite conclusion. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, according to this, um, it seems it would be okay, right? Um, yeah, develop with VMD, right? This, according to this, it would be okay to extend them. But we have another version of his answer that's the opposite. Hold on before that. Oh, sorry, here. I'm sorry, okay. According to the first version of the answer here, you should add posts. I right? add more posts and you can't just extend them. Um, that's how you should understand it. Um, that's going second answer. Um, we have in the Mishnah, it says, you should add more posts. No, no, that could mean that he extends it. Since it says you should add to the posts, that means you should extend them. So according to this version of the answer, we leave the bet in as is, and therefore it is okay to extend the, extend the corners, right? So according to the first version, we reread it as if it doesn't have a bet, and so you should add, add more posts. And according to this, we read it as is with the bet, and you can extend the posts to make them longer. Um, and so Shema Amina, with that, this one is conclusive, although there's two different versions of what Rabba's answer was. All right, that's the first question. Second question. Um, if you have more than 13 and a third, and according to the Biuda, can I um, uh, uh, extend the double posts, or do I have to do I have to put more more posts in there? And everyone knows that you can put add more posts, but the question is, can you uh, extend them? Oh, we we know this already from a baraita. This baraita is what's the smallest you can make this this bracket area. Uh, according to the, the size of the, the size of the cow, um, and how much uh, is what's the what's the largest size? Even a cord, even two cord, right? Uh, Five thousand square amot, uh, so even right, even bigger. The um, Sorry, cord. So cord is much bigger, right? Very very big, right? Um, um, as long as you keep putting more. The Biuda disagrees and says, no, not so big. Only betsa time. That's the 5,000 amot squared. Mutar, yotemi betsa time asur. Only that big. Otherwise, not. So the Biuda is more machmir in this. Amlulo le de Biuda. Ia tamode bedir, besahar, mukse, vechaser. Afilu bat hameshet korim. Afilu bat asada korim. She mutar. Hold on, so the, the rabbi's question of Yudah says, wouldn't you agree regarding these different kinds of closed in areas and stable a backyard, a courtyard, that you can even make them much bigger? Court is huge, five court, right? 10 court, um, and that is allowed? Wouldn't you agree? Malahan, no, zomechisa ve'elu pasin. In those cases where you have a big courtyard or a big pen, uh, those have actual walls. Right? And that's why you can make it bigger. But this only has corner brackets. Um, and therefore, corner brackets only work up to two se'a. Okay, that's the discussion of the Braita. Now we're going to bring a proof from this. If you think that I, am, I can extend the corners uh, for, for according to the Bi'yoda, right? Try to imagine 
um, if this was like not not ten but a hundred long, okay, if this was a hundred long, and you had to extend the corner till it made a, 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 a till the space was less than a third, thirteen and a third. In that case, it would be almost all wall, except for right, except except for a thirteen uh, a, 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 and a third and a, and a little a little bit less than that. It would be almost all wall. So you know, if it were permitted, then the statement that he said. I should have said, this is a mechitza and this is a mechitza. You know, they both look the same. So why would he make a distinction between a courtyard that can be very big and this, then this one, which um, cannot be very big if it's basically a wall along the whole thing? We answer that, actually, there's still a difference. Regarding the courtyard, it follows the laws of uh, mechitzot. And the mechitza, a wall is not a wall, it has something, a uh, space bigger than 10. But the, the corner B, the corner, uh, um, the corner brackets uh, work, on, work under the law of Pasin, and, um, and there the space can be up to 13 and a third. So although even in that case, if no one in that particular case happens to be mostly wall, it's still not the same law um, as a regular courtyard. And so, therefore, he would still make a difference. And so, that therefore, there's no proof that can be brought to um, to answer um, Ravas Abaye's question in that case. Okay. Um, and now, third question. Let's say I have a mound of dirt uh, that looks uh, like this, right? And so I have, you know, the corner back brackets, but one of the corner brackets, or all of them, doesn't matter, is a big mound of dirt, right? And um, it has, you know, it goes up 10 to Fahim, so it does, have, it does have height, and it slopes down, and the slope is of, you know, uh, the hypotenuse would be four amot, you can calculate the rest of it, right? Um, would this be itself, even though it's not shaped as a bracket, just a mound of dirt, would, can this count as a mound of dirt? Uh, can this count as a corner bracket? That's the question. And his answer is, Tinitua. Abba always gives the same answer. Why, why are you asking me? We have a Braitha. He's always looking for an authoritative source. So we can learn from a parallel halacha. Let's say I had a block square, a cube block. Um, so this is okay. This can act as a diomad, even though it's a square. We can imagine as if, if you would have cut, you would cut into it this way and this way, right? And if there would be an ama here and an ama there, um, then even though it's more filled in, the fact that it's more filled in doesn't, doesn't detract from it. And so that is a good diomad double bracket. Um, good. He says a similar law regarding just a rock, you know, a round rock. He says something even further. I can take this round rock and I can cut it from, from two sides, right? I would have to cut the inside to make these two straight walls. And the outside, I don't actually have to cut it. As long as in my imagination, if I cut, if I would cut out and make straight lines, if what's left would be an amad this way and an amad that way, then it's okay. As long as that material is there, I can imagine, even though it doesn't look like a bracket, see, the benefit of a bracket is it's clearly breaking it off the space. You're going to continue the lines. Just a rock doesn't have the right shape. Yet, um, these sages say, one that says a uh, square one, which has at least half of the shape, and, they, and the Bishmael says, even a round one um, has enough material, we can imagine it as if it's a break. Okay, that's the two opinions. Um, now, what are these two opinions arguing about? The first sage says, we can use one imaginary slice. That's enough, right? But you can't make two imaginary slices. But the second one says, yeah, we're going to use, he had a bigger imagination. And he says, yeah, we can use two and slice it both ways and, and still, still be able to see that the bracket as if it's there.
Okay, so that's what the two sages have said. The point for us is that, according to the second sage that says around a rock is okay, so too, a mound of dirt, we can imagine that this mound is kind of cut in, and since it has the right height, uh, we can use it. We we'll just you know, cut away the sides and cut away the inside, and we can imagine as if it is, in fact, a good corner, bra corner bracket. Okay, and last question. So if we have um, if we have a uh, reeds, all right, that are you know, just single reeds, and we set them up like this, between each one and the next is less than three tefachim. So we apply the rule of lavud, and we consider it as if it's filled in. Is that a good bracket or not? In other words, can you combine the law of lavud together with the law of of uh, pase bilaot? Right. I mean, we have so little material to begin with. There's so much space. Maybe you'll say you have so much space here. You can't have even more space here, and also. Uh, talk about lavud, right? Or can we apply both of these principles together and consider this fine as a corner bracket? That's the question. Oh, we learned this already. So it talks about three cases, a tree or a fence or a, um, a barrier of reeds. So when this is a barrier of reeds, isn't that what it means? That you have reeds that are separated, each three less, each less than three tefachim apart, so therefore it's allowed. We say, la gud rita de kane. No, maybe not. Maybe it's talking about a whole thicket of reeds, all close, all, all close together. It doesn't say that they're separated. Well, if it's a thicket of reeds, that's like a bush. That's the same as a tree. Why would you have to say a tree and a chisat kanim? Those would be the same thing. So it must be that they're separated, and it is a good proof that's allowed. Now we reject this again. So wait, if if uh, according to the according to your opinion that it's all separate, um, separate reads, well, separate reads, that's similar to a fence. That's like a picket fence. So that is also has a double, uh, is, is also repetitive. So what, do you, what would you say? That's two different kinds of fences, right? Different types of fences. One made out of reeds, made out of wood. So I'll say the same thing. Could be two different kinds of trees. One is a bush and one is a tree. And even though they're basically the same principle, two different examples. And therefore, you don't have um, a proof. Okay, that's, the, that's his answer according to one version, but there's a second version of his answer. Some say a second version actually of the question. The question to begin with was, can we use a, a bush, a thicket of reeds that are all close together? Um, so oh we learned it from the same braita. It says um, a thicket made out of reeds. Isn't a thicket made out of reeds meaning thick reeds that are all together? And so you therefore you see it's allowed. We say lo kane kane pachod mishelosha. Maybe that's that's referring to thin reeds that are um, spaced apart. Wait, but then that would be repetitive. It shouldn't be that because you have a, a, a picket fence. So that's the same. So it can't be that. It must be talking about the thick one, and therefore the thick one is allowed. Wait, but if you say a thick one, that is also repetitive because the thick bushes are the same as a tree. So it's going to be repetitive no matter what. So I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, oh, it's two types of trees. So I'll say the same thing. Is talking about two kinds of uh, two two kinds of fence, and therefore there is no proof either way from this paraita whether you can use um, the, the the reeds in such a way. And so that ends uh, that series of, of questions. And tomorrow we'll look forward to um, seeing a few more questions. Amen.